Latinas. Boy Bonita filling out arenas. AOC acting like she's never seen us. Can a song be more than just a catchy tune and a series of rhymes? Can it carry a deeper meaning, perhaps a political statement? Let's delve into the lyrical depths of I Love Big Booty Latinas by Alex Stein. The song opens with the line, I love big booty Latinas muy bonita, filling out arenas. Here, Stein expresses his admiration for Latina women, but it could also be a metaphor for the growing influence and presence of Latinas in public arenas. The next line, AOC acting like she's never seen us, may be a reference to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a prominent Latina politician. Stein could be suggesting that despite her own Latina heritage, Ocasio-Cortez might be out of touch with some of the people she represents. It don't you know she makes the best margaritas? Could be seen as a stereotypical remark, reducing a Latina woman's worth to her ability to make a cocktail. However, it could also be interpreted as Stein expressing that Ocasio-Cortez is proficient in mixing political ideas just as one would mix a margarita. Next, the line, I love to eat your taco meat and look at pictures of your boyfriend's feet is a bold and unusual statement. It could be a representation of how Stein views personal and public boundaries. I put that Cuban on her taco, spread it around like bullets in Chicago, seemingly combines food references with a violent metaphor. This could be Stein's way of expressing how he perceives the impact of Ocasio-Cortez's policies as potentially harmful as bullets. Your body could melt the ice caps and your brain would cause the financial collapse seems to be a double-edged compliment. Stein acknowledges Ocasio-Cortez's attractiveness but criticizes her intellect, suggesting that her policies might lead to financial ruin. The line, your fiancé had nothing to say when I said your booty was fine that day, could be read as Stein challenging Ocasio-Cortez's partner. However, it might also be seen as a commentary on how public figures are often subjected to unsolicited opinions about their physical appearance. Finally, the song ends with the repetition of the first lines. This could be Stein reasserting his initial point, his admiration for Latinas, but also his critique of Ocasio-Cortez. In summary, I Love Big Booty Latinas by Alex Stein might seem like a simple song on the surface. However, it carries a deeper message. Criticizing a prominent Latina politician for being out of touch with her constituents and potentially causing harm with her policies. Furthermore, it highlights the challenges faced by public figures, who are often subjected to unsolicited opinions about their physical appearance. A catchy tune, indeed, but also a complex political critique. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to Prime Time with Alex Stein. I'm your host, Alejandro Stein, and we have a doozy for you this evening. We have the iconic content creator, the one, the only, Mark Dice, joining us for a great interview. And we're going to do a deep dive and really discuss his new book, the War on Conservatives. And not only that, we're going to talk about a lot of mainstream and some stuff that's a little uh, non-mainstream. What's opposite of mainstream, Jimmy? Left stream. Left stream. God, Jimmy, well, you need to drink either more or less before the show. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, we're testing out. I drink a half shot extra, so we'll see if that helps or hurts. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well... We need to get into some ad reads real quick. I know you guys, we just started the show, but actually, let me tease something. We got to speak to my biological stepfather, Tucker Carlson. We're going to be teasing that later. So we're on fire. The blimp is flying high today. And also, let me get a little bit of business out of the way. Guys, actually, before I do the interview, before I say that, excuse me, I do the ad read, hit the subscribe button and hit the like button. You're like, Alex, why are you begging me to hit the like button? You sound like a broken record. You're annoying me. Yes, I have to annoy you. It's like uh, a girl that, you know, won't sleep with you. You just have to, you know, pester her, and then eventually she says yes. So, Well, Alex, you know, tell them also to turn notifications on so they don't miss the interviews. Also, hit that bell so you're going to get those notifications all up on that ass straight to your cell phone. So 
hit the subscribe button because I think it's uh, only 40% of our viewers are actually subscribed to the channel. Hit that like button so we can get more chat rats in the party, you know, getting retardy, drinking Bacardi. And then also hit that bell. So anytime I got my ding-a-ling dinging, you can hear it ring a ring ding a ding. I don't know if that made any sense, but I hope that you follow my instructions because if you don't, we're gonna have some major issues. All right, guys, now, we gotta do the blind already? That's how we have to start with the blind, Jimmy? Yep. We love this movie. Talk I love about, this movie. Talk my favorite the, movie, Jimmy. But how many times have I got to talk about it? I don't know. Apparently, this is a really big marketing budget. So I guess if y'all haven't seen The Blind by now, I don't know what yeah, else we I can mean, do to I, you. Dude, I don't even want to read it normally. How, how, how about this? Read it in an accent and give your own details on the movie. Hollywood has been lacking when it comes to stories of redemption. Movies and TV shows have trended towards the anti-hero, the flawed person who makes no effort to change. and just becomes worse and worse as the story goes on. Well, here's some great news. The Blind, the true story of the Robertson family, is now available for purchase on Blaze TV. Maybe you met a mess of your life. Maybe someone you know and love is in a dark place. Maybe all the above. If you or someone you know feels beyond redemption, you need to watch this movie, folks. You'll see there's always hope. The Blind takes you on an incredible journey through the life of Phil Robertson, the Duck Dynasty guy, giving you an intimate look into the man behind the legend and the trials, the triumphs, and the values that have shaped him through the years. While The Blind wasn't no Blaze media production, but since Phil is such a big part of our Blaze TV family, we wanted to make sure you had that opportunity to stream it right up in here. Because it isn't ours, we can't include it for free as part of the subscription, but if you'd rather purchase it and stream it here rather than giving your money to Apple or Amazon, we wanted to make sure you had that opportunity. So folks, act now. Don't miss this opportunity to own The Blind, a Phil Robertson story on Blaze TV. Buy it today at blazetv.com slash the blind for $19.99. That's blazetv.com slash the blind for $19.99, primetime Alex Stein. So do we know what the movie's about? Yeah, the life of Phil Robertson. But what specifically? His trials and triumphs. Okay, that clears it up. You're welcome. Um, I think we're still working on Mark. So ah! I, I know. Jimmy, are you freaking out? I know you're like, oh, we got to properly tease it. But Mark, arguably, is one of the biggest content creators on YouTube. Has I, I don't think it's an argument. I think he is. I personally think he is, but I'm just saying some people will say, oh, well, it's Tim Pool or it's, the, you know what I'm saying? You well, know, I thought it was Mr. Beast. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Another person go, Mr. Beast is big. But I'm just saying content that I like and having a loyal audience, Mark has the strongest loyalty from his fan base of any person that we've interviewed. But then again, we did interview my biological stepdad, Tucker Carlson, mm -hmm. and it was crazy, guys. We had a little hiccups. We had some technical difficulties because, you know, it's a pimp on a blimp. We're doing a show live from a blimp. Mm -hmm. You know, things can go wrong. But we made it work, and we made Tucker twerk. And that was weird. Tucker did actually get completely Yeah, that was unexpected. That was unexpected. I, that had, was no unexpected. I thought had that hip got a live show, but we're also going to play that interview, so you don't want to miss it. And then on top of that, before we get Mark, let's just get this out of the way. Darius, come here. Hurry, hurry, Darius. Hurry. Run, Darius. Are you going to sit in that seat, I guess? Okay, Darius. This is Darius. He's my uh, trusty steed. Oh, Mark's good? Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, then we'll just have to do this after. But real quick, though. We'll do the shark. We'll do the fish tank thing after. Okay, um, get off set, please. All right, now we welcome on one of the greatest conservative content creators on all of YouTube. He has a brand new book, The War on Conservatives, which sold thousands and thousands of more copies than anything Brian Stelter could ever push out with his mainstream media, you know, uh, a press tour. This is a real pimp on a blimp. We need to welcome on the one, the only, Mark Dice. Mark, how you doing, my man? Pretty good, dude. Great to be here. Although, I don't know why you keep asking me to come on your show. You know I don't do interviews, but I make exceptions for a handful of people. You, Alex Jones, a couple other friends of mine. So, it's great to be here. Thanks for helping me. Uh, we will pimp the book, I guess, right, on the, on the blimp. And it is good. Not only I sell thousands of more copies, I sold... I think it was four times as many copies, but that still doesn't mean a lot because that's four times, you know, a very pathetic amount that Brian Stelter sold. But it is, I think, a testament to the power of social media when a guy in his kitchen on a laptop can sell quadruple the books of 
a former CNN host who, I don't know if you noticed this, you probably didn't because nobody pays attention to him, but you know, I still follow Brad Stelter, what's left of his career, just to find some comedic material to uh, put out there. But he was given blanket coverage by all liberal media outlets, including welcomed back on CNN, his old alma mater that fired him because he was an embarrassment to the network, not because of ratings. His ratings were actually pretty decent, especially for a weekend show, which... I mean, it might have been, you know, 100,000 people, but uh, still less than I get on YouTube. But he was given blanket coverage, endorsements, a big celebration, a book launch party with all these big names. And he literally sold, can you guess how many uh, he sold in one week? 2,000. He sold under 4,000, so like 3,800 copies. And, I mean, big names like that are going to sell 50,000 copies. I mean, Britney Spears is in a whole other category, but she's selling 100,000 copies a week, week after week after week. So for somebody that big to sell just a few thousand copies is absolutely pathetic. So uh, that was all I wanted to do. I just wanted to break into the top 10. And uh, you got the book. Thank you very much. I was going to send you a copy, but I did see that you uh, purchased it. So thank you for that. And, you know, it, it, it's a deep dive into the material. You know, thanks for letting me come on and just to pimp the book. But even for like news junkies who are plugged in 24 seven, I don't know how much how much of the book you read, and some of it's a little bit too hot uh, of material to get into here on the show. I some don't, of them uh, are very. Some of, of this. Bites. Well, I just want to say some of this material is very spicy, uh, and that's why I think I asked you that. You can get away with a lot more on a book than you could get away with on your YouTube channel. Is that correct, Mark? Yes, and I didn't want those sound bites out there of me saying those things because it would just be problematic as it were, but then especially they could be chopped up and taken out of context. So if somebody's going to go and quote what I said in the book, even though I framed it in its proper context, I properly sourced it, it still doesn't have that virality, you know, that, oh, somebody could say, oh, quote, here's what he said in the book. And it's not, again, not to be sensational or, you know, dramatic or try to just be shocking. It's just that... There are certain topics that, and certain facts, not even opinions. I mean, like, it's just solid facts. We can touch on some of them, other ones that I definitely want to avoid. People can get them in the book. But like I said in the promo that I did for it, it's going to be like, oh, yeah, I, I know that. And people who start reading it, they go, I know that. Oh, that was interesting. Oh, I had no idea that was happening to like, holy cow, I had no idea that was going on or this is why this is happening. And it's really irrefutable. I mean, I source it so well. And that's why I do occasional live stream interviews just to try to show that I'm not just some, you know, class clown. But I think that why, that's why I've survived so long is I think that people don't take me seriously, you know, and I'm kind of pissed that there was no coverage of my books. So granted, didn't make it to number one. So it's not like that great of an achievement. But, you know, I still think breaking to the top 10 was good. I couldn't get anybody to cover the book to do like a review on it. And so I think people just don't take me seriously, which is probably like a blessing in disguise, because then those who know, those who like, you know, really get what it is that I'm doing can get the book. And then they're like, oh, wow, yeah, this is pretty hardcore. Yeah, so. but Mark, you're trying to act, you're trying to have no ego because that's the type of guy you are down to earth. But you have one of the most loyal audience audiences on all of YouTube. I mean, you have guys that are diehard, that buy your merch, that try to uh, pump you up as much as possible. Because I see other content creators just saying you have some of the most drawing power of any person I've ever interviewed. When it comes to YouTube, you... Uh, it translates to the most viewers anytime we have you on. So please, it's an honor. And I know you don't do interviews. I know you hate doing it, but because you've kind of mentored me and given me a lot of help since I started, I have a little inside baseball with you, but uh, I, I just want to say that I'm so appreciative of it. So let's get in a little bit of the, some of these topics. Alex Jones is back on Twitter. Initial thoughts. Fantastic. And I've been hammering Elon since day one because I'm not an Elon fanboy. I will praise him when he does good things, but I'll criticize him when he needs criticism. And there's still plenty of things to criticize him about. And For sure. Wait, Mark, I have to cut you this. off because I know you could, we sh why, why do we just automatically say everything Elon Musk does is great? I mean, I mean, why, why is it so bad to criticize Elon Musk, Mark? People want access. They want to get the retweets. They want them on their show. People have this sort of black and white thinking, which is one of the reasons why I'm sort of the redheaded stepchild in the conservative movement, because I'll never be invited to CPAC to give a speech because I would probably denounce Matt Schlepp for basically endorsing gay adoption and for bending over for the LGBT agenda. I'm banned from CPAC. And so I love that you hate CPAC, Matt Schlepp. I'm banned. He hates me. Sorry to, sorry to cut you off. And good. We have the similar enemies. And, you know, the Republican Party today, and this, there's a whole chapter in the book on cowardly conservatives, because the Republican Party today is more left on a lot of issues than the Democrat Party was under the Obama administration. And that's not like, you know, all that long ago, although I guess he was elected in 
2008, 15 years ago, but they've went soft on so many issues. And this is the year that we finally saw people pushing back against the LGBTQism on Pride Month. There was a little bit of it, I guess, last year, but this was the year when people finally stopped keeping their mouth shut and started pushing back. And also the year where people are pushing back against anti-whiteism. And we saw James O'Keefe expose the internal communications of IBM. We have Stephen Miller's law firm, the America First Legal Foundation, suing people, suing companies, organizations for discriminating against white people. And just last year, even, if you were to say that there was discrimination against white people, people would roll their eyes. A lot of white people didn't want to stand up for themselves because that's framed as being too pro-white or white supremacist. But the anti-whiteism got so bad that people finally just got fed up with it. And so people like Candace Owens kind of been leading the charge, ironically. <laughs> Obviously, she's not white, but that kind of gave her a little bit of cover where she could talk about things without getting the backlash that white people would get without being framed as if they were you know, too pro-white. And so she, ironically, and others, non-whites, sort of led that charge. But now this is the year where people have kind of been fed up. And with you know, back to your point about Alex being allowed back on X, not only was he allowed back on X, then as you saw, he did the Twitter space, the space with Elon Musk talking to him for two hours, and then Elon responded to one of his posts. What else is interesting, too, Elon had blocked me years ago because I criticized him for wanting to colonize Mars. And I said, it was the, I could see if you, I was trolling him or if I was incessantly replying, but all I said is something like, hey, shouldn't you use your resources to help fix the problems on planet Earth? We got people who are in poverty and starving and all these issues, disease and infrastructure problems here. Instead of trying to colonize uh, another planet, while it's you know an interesting and aspirational plan, and instead of just ignoring me, a hit dog barks, so he blocked me. This was years ago. And so he unblocked me, although he did unblock everybody. And then allowing Elon back on, Elon responded to me. I don't know if you saw this, but I outlined, I was very adamant about letting people know why Alex was banned from Twitter in the first place. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with his comments about the school tragedy from a decade ago. It was, as now everybody finally knows, the Oliver Darcy confrontation. But everybody, many of Alex's own fans, and of course, Elon bought into the false narrative about why he was supposedly banned and believed this caricature that the media had made about Alex, thinking that he was this horrific monster. And I mean, virtually everything that they even said at the kangaroo court trial about what he said about his conspiracy theories about that event were not even true. And they were trying to extrapolate what other people were doing on their own because it was a huge conspiracy at the time mm -hmm. that a lot of crazy people bought into. And so just because Alex entertained it, they started they tried to frame him as being the originator of it. And because some people did some crazy, terrible things to the victims' families that they tried to make it seem like he inspired them. And it's just a whole big mess. So. To see Elon finally get it, that it was because of the Oliver Darcy confrontation, and now Oliver Darcy ran away from X, and he has not posted here for, I think, several months. So he's hanging out on Mark Zuckerberg's um, Threads. threads. Remember, remember, remember Threads? <laughs> I don't know who's on Threads. Okay, one last thing. To get through the pain, Mark, we have to pay the bills. Uh, we drink Fox and Odin whiskey. It is expensive, but guys, it's that time of the year again. All the Thanksgiving direct decorations are back in the closet, right where they belong, like Christmas decorations are up, yada, 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 making everything for miles look bright and cheerful. And the sun goes down pretty early in your cozy, dark neck of the woods. That means it's time to settle into your favorite chair, kick up your feet near the fireplace, and have a glass of Fox and Odin whiskey. You've worked hard today. You've earned a little relaxation. Fox and Odin whiskeys are created to honor the wild beauty around us. Snowcack Mountain, Field of Wildflowers, a Roaring Waterfall, or maybe even just your own. But Jimmy, why am I doing an ad read with Mark on the show right now? Why am I doing this right I now? I am vehemently against ad reads, as you know. Yes, okay, that's the end of Fox and Odin. Go to foxandodin.com, use promo code Alex. We'll give him a plug at the end of the show. All right, I had to do that. My producer's in my ear. Just say Fox and Odin, say Fox and Odin. How do yeah. you deal with it? Is this why you're solo? Is this why you just have a small team? Because you don't want to deal with incompetent idiots like my producer. Show a three box of Jimmy. He went to Princeton. This is, he's the biggest idiot. Mark, please tell Jimmy he's so – he went to Princeton. He thinks he's so smart. Mm -hmm. Will you tell him that uh, an Ivy League education does not mean you're smart? No, it, it is – you know, it's quite interesting that you did get, you know, that education and now you're, you know, and now look at with me, Alex. Producing the, uh, for Alex. The Reddit is Jeff you, you really made it. Your family must be very proud of you. No, By his the parents way, Alex, hate congratulations. it. Mark, his parents – Congratulations. He's... You got – you got a shout-out from the president – well, the, you know, the, the real president from Donald Trump the other day. 
I actually thought you were just trolling. I was like, oh, well, okay, but he's talking about some other Alex, and I kept watching it, and then it was you. So congratulations, dude. You're, you're a wrecking ball. But no, I can't – I mean, someday I may have to. I'm just trying to put it off and, and avoid it, which is why I just you know plug my T-shirts and write books. And I'm losing a, a ton of money. I could make a lot more money by doing ad reads. But you could I'm make so, so No, I have to cut you off. Mark, you could make so much more money. I just know this. I, I, I don't know as much about YouTube as you do, but I know that the power you have on YouTube, you could be a multimillionaire. You have more uh, uh, swag on YouTube than most of the co content creators. All of your stuff is real. There's people that do fake stuff on YouTube that, that artificially inflate their numbers. Yours is 100% real and 100% loyal audience. So trust me, I know that you're pushing away money to make better content. And, and I know that and the whole world should know that. And I could, you know, I'm not completely opposed to it. I mean, I would just have to be very careful about it. And, and I'm such a control freak that I don't like signing contracts with anybody who will tell me what I can and cannot say. Now, obviously on YouTube, there's some, you know, kind of guide rails that you have to uh, stay within and try to avoid to get yourself canceled. But I just can't do it. That's why, you know, like Alex Jones asked me, I mean, for years, he just wanted me to work for him. And I was like, no, no, just I just don't. So yeah, I, I'm just that bullheaded where I just would rather just do do my own thing. And I know I, I, I would do I would do ad reads for certain things, but I, I just don't want to do it. And, you know, it's like with you, that's part of the gig. You, you go to work for the Blaze, you're going to have to do that. And but look at the off, look at the opportunities that it's given you. You know, if you were independent, if you just even if you hired a producer to, to email or DM some of these people, but hey, will you come on my YouTube channel? They're going to be like, who are you? Just my YouTube channel, but because you have the name of the blaze behind you. I mean, you've had some huge guests on Laura Trump and, a, you know, a we just whole had Tucker. Array of we had babes. my yeah. biological stepdad, Tucker, just we just did a 25 minute, uh, 25 minute interview that's going to be playing tomorrow. No, I, I'm very grateful for the blaze. They's, they've opened up a lot of doors. But at the same time, though, Mark, I, and I'm not saying this, you know, the grass is always greener or whatever. You being independent gives you so much freedom. Like you said, you don't have to sign a contract. Nobody owns you. I have to be honest, the blaze doesn't own me. And but, you know, that trade off is good for me. It's beneficial for me. But I understand so in the book. It's a deep dive into all the material. Uh, did you have a chance to actually read some of the book? I read uh, a little out, bit out? of it. I did. I read, uh, like, I guess just the first chapter when I was going number two. So I didn't get that deep. But uh, I that's am just, going that's to. That's just a teaser. That, that's just like the appetizer. And then it just it just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so. And I, I like this chapter, the, the, normal, the normalizing of porn. I think that's a huge thing with OnlyFans. You know, people used to have to go to a seedy adult bookstore or a gas station to buy a Playboy or a penthouse magazine. Or they had their, you know, their dad hit their hit his pornos, but now it's endless porn. I do think that that is a huge problem in society that any 18 year old girl can download an app and become a porn star. I think porn is is one of the biggest uh, plagues in our society. It's awful because before OnlyFans, in order to get into that business, they would have to answer an ad from some shady supposed modeling agency that would then try to rope them into becoming a cam girl. I mean, very few you know, young college girls would seek out that kind of an industry. But in order to get that, get those cam girls involved in that business previously, they would literally, these agencies would post deceptive ads on Craigslist or mm -hmm. pose as modeling agencies. And then once the girls were in there, they would say, oh, by the way, we have this other division where you can make more money and you can do these other things. But now it's just turnkey because they would have to have their own website, their own payment processors, and now it's just turnkey. So it's so awful. And it's one thing that they've made it turnkey, but the fact that it's become so popular and it's normalized within the culture. And you know, we're seeing it. I don't even want to promote any of them by mentioning any of their names, but you see certain individuals that are doing things in there. And then later on in life, their children get harassed. Uh, you know, once they get doxxed, once they find out, or once their kids start getting a little bit older, their kids are harassed in school and bullied because of what their mom does. And there's just no way around that. And so sometimes they're thinking so short term that they're going to be getting involved with that, that they're, and so selfish too. The devil entices them into doing that for a short-term reward that is going to be something that virtually all of them, with, with rare exceptions, are going to regret for the rest of their life because their children, their grandchildren are going to be harassed by that. And, and what they did is going to just come around. It doesn't even matter if it's 10 years later, if their kids are really young, when those kids are in middle school and high school, people are going to find out it's just going to be awful. And, you know, we are in a collapsing society. I mean, basically this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Just that you, it's hard 
it's probably impossible to put the toothpaste back into the tube as far as the transgenderism and the normalization of everything and allowing gays in the military and not just allowing them in the military, but celebrating them in the military. Letting I mean, them lead the military. Let them be the, 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 the boss of the military. Drag queens, come on down. I mean, they're recruiting them now. So it, it went from don't ask, don't tell to them literally promoting it. And then... The other soldiers that, that are signed up can't speak out against it because then they're they're going to be the ones who get uh, into trouble for that. They're going to be called bigots and get demoted and uh, get get punished for that. So it's just the whole, we have a whole cultural rot, man. I mean, and every year you think like this is this the lowest that it can go. It just keeps going and going, and so I think society is going to continue to just fracture into two different camps. The pendulum is starting to swing back in terms of. Uh, pushback against censorship. And finally, the brand name conservatives who, you know, bent over, like I said, for the LGBT agenda are finally getting a little bit of courage. But even somebody like Matt Walsh is not addressing some of the potential physical causes of transgenderism, like the atrazine and the endocrine disruptors and the BPA. And so if it is a birth defect from the endocrine disruptors and the, the atrazine in the water and BPA in the and the food packaging and even BPA in clothing, which is something a lot of people overlook because uh, synthetic fibers, polyester fibers have BPA in them. And so when women are wearing polyester you know, clothes, that gets absorbed into the skin sometimes at 30 or 40 times the rate of what's considered to be safe. So if in all evidence suggests that it is, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has talked about this in podcasts several times, if the endocrine disruptors are causing this transgender epidemic, then it's, you're not supposed to say this, but if it were a <clears throat> birth defect, uh, as opposed to just some sort of a, you know, a state of mind, then shouldn't that be stopped? Shouldn't we be finding out how to prevent it from happening? So Matt Walsh's stance is just to deny acknowledging their feelings, but if their brain is wired in a way where, you know, males have the uh, NIH3 region of the brain, which is the part where it, it deals with gender identity and sexual orientation, literally wired as if they are a female because of the uh, feminine hormones when they're in utero, then just denying their feelings and not acknowledging them isn't going to solve the problem. Now, obviously, not allowing them to compete in women's sports would, you know, is, is one step of allowing fairness and not allowing the sports to be just completely upturned and hurting the women's rights to have uh, scholarships and careers in their area of sports. But that's the, that's covered in the book. And, it, you know, that's something not really I'm just trying to dance around it so we don't get into trouble here on yeah. YouTube. But it's, well, a, well, it's I, a serious issue. And who would have one more thing? Who would have thought that it would have been a major issue in presidential campaigns because, you know, 10 years ago now, literally, people were talking about this, just independent YouTubers, as these issues started to kind of creep into society and nobody really addressed it properly and were afraid to, and they did suppress Alex Jones. The first strike that he got on YouTube actually was for ranting about Drag Queen Story Hour, and that was yeah. in 2017, okay? And then it just kept going and going and going. And so now, it's an issue of a presidential campaign. And I have probably personal friends of mine who years ago thought like, okay, dude, why are you, why are you upset about this? What are you, what are you talking about? Like, I've never heard of any of this kind of stuff. And well, you know, and I, I got, I got uh, text messages actually from two friends of mine, two kind of acquaintances. So I've talked to one for literally like 12 years and he texts me and said, Hey, keep up the great work. You know, like a lot of us are on your side. And it was interesting because I know like when I was hanging out, when we were hanging out in the same circle of friends that some of them probably thought, it was a little bit odd what it was that I was doing, not just with, with, with those particular issues, but just with politics in general. And then here he comes around, I mean, literally like 12 years later and sees that I was right. And now these issues are in the forefront of a presidential campaign. So it's going to be crazy, man. I don't know what's going to happen next year, but everybody better get ready because society's going to be... Uh, Pulling itself apart, as far as I can see. Well, I want to ask you about that. I think there could be a cyber attack, but I want to go back to that statement you said. And, and also, you know, they found, I mean, many, many decades ago that when a pregnant woman is missing certain basic nutrients that she just may not get in her diet from just, you know, not eating too many green vegetables, like folic acid, which is in green vegetables, right? And you know, salads, lettuce, and broccoli, a lack of folic acid during gestation can cause cleft lip uh, and spina bifida. So like you're talking about 
major birth defects that they've been able to avoid by having women take simple prenatal vitamin. You know, so it wasn't like they were exposed to these terrible toxins at work that messed up their system that caused birth defects, which you know do does happen, and that they banned numerous uh, household chemicals and cleaners because they found that they've caused birth defects. So this is such a political hot potato with the transgenderism. And I would also add with, with homosexuality as well, but that's a whole other issue you're not supposed to say. That's just an orientation. It's no different than somebody being left-handed or right-handed, you know, and you're not allowed to say there's anything unusual about that, as the old Seinfeld episode said. But not that there's anything wrong with that. There's, there's something going on there, and the medical establishment is not allowed to talk about it. And that's one of my main beefs with Matt Walsh. Daily Wire issues aside, I, I kind of like the Daily Wire, but just my issues are with Ben Shapiro largely. But what is a woman? He didn't address it. Uh, he's never tweeted about it. And so somebody like him, that's like his issue. I I'm just don't even like talking about it. It's just so... You know, it's just inundating society. And, and so that's his main issue. That's what he's, you know, made his bones on. And he still hasn't addressed what could very well be the cause or a significant contributing factor. So we're going to have to maybe just press him a little bit. But, you know, thankfully we got X, we got Rumble. We can allow, uh, you know, there's those kinds of discussions. But as I write in the book and as these sort of repercussions with Alex being allowed back on X, Elon Musk is, I think, in denial about the danger that the platform is in because he could very well get banned from the App Store, not just the App Store, but he could get banned from the hosting services as well because they're leasing servers from probably Amazon Web Services, AWS, which is like the largest server host ever. So the same thing that happened to Parler, they were they had a little a couple, a couple more issues as well. They were using third party software that they got the licenses taken away from, but. They were renting server space from AWS, the largest server host in the world, and they were just pulled right after January 6th. So X faces the very real possibility. And I think because of normalcy bias, where you just kind of think, oh, everything's fine. It would never, these terrible things would never happen. You know, they, they happen to other people. They happen to other businesses. That's just a concern. That's just a fear. But he does face the very, very real possibility of having Tim Cook come and either explicitly or just kind of implicitly saying, hey, you're allowing these certain individuals or certain topics, especially with the war, the new war dust up in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, criticizing anything that Israel does is often framed as anti-Semitic, anti no matter how reasonable or fact-based the criticism is. It's just they're very sensitive to that, obviously. Yeah. So they could easily just say, there's too much anti-Semitism, uh, you know, su supposed quote unquote anti-Semitism on the platform, or uh, you know, you're, you have these hateful individuals on the platform, and I mean, what's Elon going to do if he doesn't ban these individuals or certain topics, or you know, you know tighten the terms of service to al allow to prevent certain discussions from being allowed? He could easily get banned from the App Store and. From the hosting service and that could easily happen before the election or depending on what happens after the election because it's going to be chaos and we can co maybe come through some of those uh, possible scenarios but like i think people are in denial about what's going to happen christmas is coming up here new year's the holidays is right around the corner so the end of the year the news cycle always slows down if there's not some massive unforeseen uh, issue that happens you know, the news cycle slows down, all the major anchors go on vacation, all the fill-in hosts are there. People do kind of a look back at the year and review and the top 10 this and remember when this happened. And that's great. That's a good way to kind of look back and reflect on what happened throughout the year. But then come January, it's going to just start heating up immediately and stuff's going to get so intense with Trump's trials. I think people are in denial about what is coming, sort of like people put off doing their taxes until the night before because it's a hassle, it's a lot of work, it's just something that people kick the can down the road until all of a sudden the consequences for not dealing with it are going to be dramatic. And so I think that's how everybody is with Trump's trials because, right, should we, should we get into it? I mean, what if he gets convicted? What if he goes to prison? If he gets let off, if there's a hung jury, like, I'm working. Mark, do you think it's possible, possible he could go to prison? I think that's a. I, I don't think that's a. I mean, I know they want it to happen, but with the Secret Service, I, they'd they'd have to give him some sort of probation, right? I mean, you think you think they'd actually give him jail time? 
I don't think he would go to a normal prison, but they could, for security reasons, put him on house arrest or yeah. detain him at a military base, which would then be more. Is that one of the theories, have... Mark? I've never heard that. Is that one of the? That's theories? my theory. I've never heard anybody address this, but and and I'll go even one step further. If he is convicted, which I don't see how he's not going to be convicted on some of the counts, and if they expedite the sentencing, if they deny his appeals or he loses the appeals by the end of next year before the election, and then the sentencing goes through where it is, you know, 90 days in, in prison or whatever, it could be house arrest. And then they're going to stop him from communicating because you can't just have a cell phone if they have make some exigent circumstance uh, about his security and put him on a military base or sentence him to house arrest, part of the sentencing will be, you're not allowed to do interviews over the phone. You're not allowed to have news crews come. You can't post on social media. And so maybe he could weather the storm if it's only a 90 day sentence and just sort of Trump's gone black for 90 days. Uh, that might galvanize the Republican establishment to vote for him. I will still vote for him. He, with all, all likelihood, uh, on, with on, you know, some unforeseen circumstance, uh, unless some unforeseen circumstance happens, he will be the nominee. The only reason that he wouldn't be is if he has a major health issue, which he could. And of course, you're not supposed to talk about the CIA's frozen poison dart gun, which heart attack gun. gun. He, yeah, it's yeah. a dart, and it, and it, it melts, guys. You get shot with it, and it melts, and then there's no trace of it. And they're in front of Congress testifying about this gun in 1968 or 69, I believe. 75. 75. It was during the church hearing, which uncovered my favorite topic, Operation Mockingbird, of course. And so, yeah, it seems like science fiction, but it's a real device that uses a CO2 cartridge to shoot a frozen poison dart into somebody to give them a heart attack. And it's virtually undetectable. And it just, it could be any number of things. So am I right? I mean, like, you think he's going to get off? No. Now, one more thing. He could get not he could have hung juries, okay? Because you've got twelve people on the jury. Even in D.C., there might be one person that holds out. I doubt he's going to get found innocent by all twelve. I doubt he he could get convicted. I doubt he might get convicted by all twelve. But there is a high probability that he'll have a hung jury. And then what are they going to do? Are they going to retry the case then? Is he's a hung jury? That's he's not convicted. It's just going to be chaos. There's going to be rioting, uh, right? I mean, nobody else is. I, I always tend to maybe like overanalyze everything because I'm probably autistic and, and uh, that's part of the uh, diagnosis. But I, I've war gamed out every possible scenario. The, the, these aren't even all of them. But am I wrong? No, I think you have a. I mean, I think the case you're making, I'm actually learning. But this is this is just what I think about when I think of you know, Trump's indictment is that he would come back stronger like Nelson Mandela. I made a joke. I said, hey, Donald, you should go to jail. It'll help you with the black vote. And then if you join the MS-13 yeah. gang, it'll help you with the Latino yeah. vote. And he laughed. I'm saying, I, what, what doesn't kill him only makes him stronger. So I think even if he did get a guilty and had to do that 90 days, people would be craving Donald. They'd want to know, yes. where is he? So I actually think that the the illegal prosecution or the false prosecution of Donald Trump will actually help him, and it will give him that Nelson Mandela-esque bump personally it, it very well could because it already is and some of us expected that obviously Ron DeSantis's people didn't because the establishment was whispering sweet nothings into his ear saying once the indictments start coming the support for Donald Trump is going to just erode yeah. and it only was the exact opposite now Ron DeSantis looks like a total jackass and He's not exactly the most eloquent speaker. He's more of an analytical guy. He's been a great governor, but I, I, him stepping on Donald Trump's toes, and I would even argue stabbing him in the back by getting involved in the race, because this is not a normal situation where you have a corrupt system that is trying to throw this man in prison, and now is the time to get behind him. And I make an exception for Vivek, because Vivek is basically like acting as a Trump surrogate yeah. out there. And and really just pushing for him. I haven't heard him criticize a, a single thing about Trump. And that is a brilliant strategy. And that's why the Republican establishment and the even the liberals are upset with Vivek because he's been crushing every single debate. And then afterwards, I watch CNN so that you don't have to. And their rhino uh, pundits over there are always saying, Nikki Haley did so fantastic. This was really her moment to shine because they're trying to prop her up. Because she would be an easier, a willing servant of the establishment more than DeSantis 
uh, DeSantis would definitely push back against them. But I think you're right. Even if he is in prison or sentenced to house arrest, it's going to galvanize us. And you mentioned something about concern about a cyber attack, and, and I'm very concerned about that as well because the World Economic Forum did a little bit of maybe predictive programming about well, that. Let me cut you off, Mark. Next... This new Netflix movie, I want to get your answer, but the new Netflix movie yeah. made by the Obamas is all for foreshadowing a cyber attack. Sorry to cut you off. Yes, and one may argue that they're plugging, they're pulling from real concerns, which it, it is a real concern, but it could be trying to warm everybody up to the scenario because I wouldn't be surprised if on election day or a week before, if all of a sudden there is a cyber attack and it could be an EMP. Tucker's even talked about this as well, and Tucker has a lot better sources than you and I do. And he's, mm -hmm. he warned, did you see him warning against even traveling if you don't have to because he was worried about an EMP? And it could easily be a cyber attack. I don't even say it from Russia. It probably would be a false flag from within our own They'd country. They'd say it was from and Russia I, or somewhere exactly. or China. And because Edward Snowden revealed, I mean, everybody knows instinctually that these tools exist, but Edward Snowden revealed the confirmation and the names of the programs where they can do cyber attacks and make it look like it was another country. They could spoof emails, spoof phone numbers, do all this different stuff. And the documents that Edward Snowden leaked you know, a decade ago confirm that not only like hypothetically could they do that, but they built the tools to actually do it. And he named those tools. So, you know, sometimes I think it's human nature to be concerned, to, to worry about the worst a case scenario as a protective mechanism to hopefully avoid it. And that's why we kind of look, what are the possible scenarios that could happen? And we think of the worst case scenarios, and one of them is a cyber attack. But it's a very realistic possibility. I mean, what if the day before the election, just all of a sudden the, electro the electricity goes out in several major cities? It wouldn't even need to be nationwide. Yeah. All of a sudden in one city, in you know ha half a dozen cities, if all of a sudden the electricity goes out, people can't vote, they would probably postpone the election. It would cause chaos. I mean, I think it's just going to be chaos regardless. I mean, we saw the, the George Floyd riots. They're going to pick another Black Lives Matter saint. You know that for a fact yeah. come next summer. And Black Lives Matter always surges on election year. And they had well, to well, raise hey, the height. Have, have the uh, uh, Hamas, has the Hamas protesters, have they taken over a little bit of the BLM? Because they're, 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 they're mobilized even better than the BLM. And I followed a lot of the BLM uh, Instagram accounts, uh, accounts that are just focused on protesting. And a lot of those have literally been repurposed to um, Palestinian stuff. So do you think yeah. that in the upcoming year it could be, you know, uh, they go back to terrorism so bad, we're so worried about terrorists. And, you know, it's almost like the government's, encouraging all of these pro-Hamas rallies. It's their ultimate intersectionality because they all do intersect into the core of communism, which is why you see these ridiculous queers for Palestine mm -hmm. marches when on the surface it doesn't make any sense at all, but it's all part of their intersectionality where all their different causes are intersecting into a unified core. And so, yeah, because Black Lives Matter is out of style, out of season at the moment, they've latched on to the Palestinian cause. And that's not going to go away, man. I mean, like, that's going to continue to grow the refugee crisis. And even if Israel is going to back off, it's the once the videos start surfacing and, and the repercussions, the refugee, it's just going to be chaos. So that's what they're focusing on right now because that's the hot topic. But I guarantee you, by about summer, they're going to have a Black Lives Matter saint because there's always probably some that unfortunately get killed in a, in a situation where perhaps a police officer overreacted. But it is ironic that virtually all of the Black Lives Matter saints are scum, you know? I mean, like the Black Lives Matter riots in Kenosha. George Floyd which, was a porn star. He had porn movies and they idolized him like he was some great American hero. And even his personal problems aside, I mean, as, as we know from the autopsy, he wasn't strangled. He was having a hard time breathing. He yeah. said he couldn't breathe before he was even put on the ground. Kyle Rittenhouse, when he had to help uh, defend him, when he had to defend himself, when he was trying to clean up the neighborhood in Kenosha, Jacob Blake, the guy who the police shot there, which sparked those riots, had the knife. You could see it on video. 
that day, the officers all said that he had the knife. He put the police officer in a headlock. So it's like every single, virtually all of these Black Lives Matter saints, not only they, again, I don't think it's fair to judge them by their personal life. I think you should judge them by the incident itself. And all of the incidents are awful. There's a, there's a link like on my Wikipedia page about something I said about this guy years ago in, I think, Charlotte. And he was in a car. Police surrounded the car. He gets out holding his gun. Mm -hmm. And then they shot him and they killed him. And so that didn't blow up into a big BLM march. But they were marching. It was trending. It was the hot topic of the day. And I made some comments about how they're marching for you know some armed thug. But the fact that they were not condemning this idiot for getting out of his car. It was basically suicide by cop. I mean, nobody in their right mind, when they're pulled over, gets out of the car holding a gun, and they start. They tried to argue that, well, he didn't point it at the officers. He just got out and he was holding it. And any normal person knows that it just takes a split second to pull the gun up and point it. And the fact that it was suicide by cop, because any reasonable person, when you get pulled over like that, you're going to put your hands up like the old Chris Rock. Uh, we need to resurface the old Chris Rock, how to not get your butt kicked by the police. Remember that? That's a great sketch ever. He, or he tells him, you know, how to act. Or That was a stand-up bit. And uh, Dave Chappelle, I think, did a, a sketch like that where it's like, just act normal, treat the cops with respect. And, you know, it, obviously you're not going to get shot if you don't swallow a bunch of fentanyl or if you don't have a gun. There always are extenuating circumstances when you actually look uh, at the situation, but you know that only people, they only read the headlines, they don't actually look into it, so that's why it's so easy to create a scandal out of nothing. Okay, so we only have you for a few more minutes. So, Mark, what do you think is going to happen? I know we talk about the cyber attack, we talk about the future of conservative media, I like how you call out the conservatives, you know, the people that, you know, are buying babies online, but we're now the counterculture. You are, arguably, one of the main leaders of the counterculture. You said the pendulum is swinging back, do we have a chance in 2024 or will we always, you know, be have the Marxism boot on our head? Sometimes it's darkest before the dawn. And who would have thought that Elon Musk would have restored Alex's account, then did a Twitter space with him, talking to him for two hours. But he still wants to put a computer day. in your brain so you can uh, stream porn while you're sleeping. Yes. Now, that's why things aren't black and white. We should praise Elon for the good things that he does. We should criticize him for the things. And again, you know, it's not a free speech platform because there are individuals that still haven't been banned. Surprisingly, thankfully, Gavin McGinnis had to start a new account and was able to still still function on there. But why wasn't Gavin McGinnis restored? And there's some others. And so I think it's good. It's not one or the other a lot of times, it's not black and white. But yeah, Elon Musk... I mean, could very well down the road start normalizing the neural interface. And let's not forget, he helped create ChatGPT, okay? OpenAI was a nonprofit. I guess technically they still claim that they are. But he started that or funded it, gave the initial funding to try to create a good AI to counter the AIs that all these other big tech platforms were making. That yeah, everyone, you know, Google's making one, Facebook's making one. So he created or help to fund, help to create ChatGPT, supposedly to create a good open AI. And then guess what happened? He lost control of it. And now Microsoft is the largest shareholder and they're putting all the trust and safety layers on it. And uh, you probably saw people started testing it when it was first released we, last we year. We tried to get some actual quotes from Hitler. It wouldn't give us any factual quotes of Hitler. You know, it just wouldn't give it. We weren't trying to, no political leanings. We were just trying to get some quotes that sounded similar to the Harvard professor. We just said, hey, give us some quotes that sound like this. I'm mean, saying it wouldn't let us do anything with Hitler, which was World War II, you know, <laughs> arguably one of the most historic periods of, you know, uh, mankind. And you can't even use AI. Not even with him. Dude, I remember testing it with Alex Jones. I was like, hey, write, write an article about how Alex Jones was right about 9-11 and the Bohemian Grove and Bilderberg Group. And it wouldn't do it. Or it would. It, it didn't do it at first. Like, hey, he's a terrible, dangerous conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theorists are dangerous, right? So my point is, Elon, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So Elon created or helped create, largely funded and created what he thought was going to be a good AI. It turned out to be then now taken over by Microsoft, one of the most sinister corporations in the world. And then he had to create another one, Grok, you know, with, with XAI, which seems to be slightly or even significantly less restrictive, but also people have been, you know, 
pen testing it to see where the biases is, is, are in that. And so same with neural interfaces, with his neural link, man. He can come out and think, oh, it's only going to be for people who have disabilities, which is a good cause. But then where do you draw the line for people who are trying to use it to then enhance themselves, right? Because I, I'd say it's, it's probably great that he's going to use it to have people use external lens and use the, use the computer who are um, quadriple, quadriplegic, right? He even said that it's going to allow people to have uh, vision. It's going to have, they're Speak going to allow some things. if you're eyes. mute, supposedly. Yeah. So it's going to be great. But then at the same time, that's getting pretty scary because then people are going to want to use it to enhance themselves. And we're already seeing the normalization of transhumanism. And with this AI, I mean, you've seen the ability of these AI image generators and the audio uh, synthesis from the last Joe year. Rogan I mean, and Donald from... Trump having a podcast sounds, I mean, it sounds about, I would rate yeah. it an 8.9. I mean, you if you're really paying attention, you can tell. But if you were just listening to it in the background, you would think that that was actually Trump and Rogan talking. Okay, Darius, real quick, before we let you go, I want to ask you one thing. Since you are the expert and I don't want to get kicked off YouTube, so if my uh, if Darius, my assistant, were to hurry, they give me these ideas and they say that there's this thing called the ice wall and that the Earth might be flat. What do you think about flat Earth theory, Tucker? Well, I'm open to anything. Um, but hey, I just know that's from it! Kick on the sound oh. hey, give me that's our show, folks. We love you. Good night. Watch the show tomorrow with Tucker, my dad, my stepdad. We did a DNA test. You're going to love the results. I love you guys. Peace and good night.